I'm honored to be able to be a part of this, to be able to be one of the leaders and one of the servants, to be able to usher in what I think God is doing today. I believe God, we remember what God did yesterday, but we have to decipher what he's doing today. And what God is doing today is always different. And that's why the Bible says whenever there was manna in the ground, God says only take enough for that day. If you take more than this day's worth, it's going to spoil. Why? Because God wants to meet you every day. God wants to speak to you every day. What blessed you last year ain't going to last this year. It's going to spoil. It's going to rotten. And we believe God is doing something new in our midst and gathering the wider body of Christ to be spiritually revitalized and gathering the hungry and broken and raising up spiritual leaders to make a kingdom impact where they are. Amen? A kingdom impact, what that means is making a difference who in, in your shoes, where you are, no matter what you do, and we're just figuring this out. Um, so we, we go into a time of preaching of God's word, and we're going to go into a time of intercessory prayer and altar ministry afterwards. But I do have something that's on my heart. Um, it's, it's weird preaching once a month. Someone once told me, like, yo, Will, it must be much easier now preaching once a month. Like I used to preach three times a week. Jesus, thank you for delivering me, right? Now I'm playing, you pastors, God bless you, right? But it's different because with once a month, there's just like this pressure, you know what I'm saying? There's this like final exam type of thing. When it's once a week, it's like, I'll just do it, right? Three times a week. But, but in the midst of that, it's a different type of preaching because I'm trying to really, I could be wrong because I'm a man, but in the spirit, asking the Lord, what meal do you want to prepare? You want a steak today, Lord? Because if that, all day, baby, steak all day, Monday through Sunday, right? You want, you want a salad? No, we don't, right? But it's like, what, what, what type of meal do you want? And God put a conviction on my heart that he wants me to speak to you guys tonight about longing for more of God. About yearning for more of God. About being hungry for the things of God. Because most people settled for religion. Most people settled for a service. Most people settle for going into a building for two hours and going home. But when you read this book, it's filled with people who had a longing, a yearning, a hunger and desire for the Lord. And it's those people that walked with God and made a difference. It was those people that didn't do great things for God, but God did great things through them. Oh, that's good right there. I used to want to do great things for God. That's called ambition, called sinful ambition. But now it's God. You do great things through me. That's different. That's yielding. That's surrendering. That's your will be done, not my will be done. And I see in this book people who longed for God. And as we go into this, let me just read a few verses to you. Exodus 33, 15, Moses says, I will not go unless your presence goes with me. I dare you to pray that before you go to work. Come on now. Lord, I ain't going to work as my coworker, mm -mm -mm. my boss, mm -mm -mm. Jesus, right? I will not go unless your presence, unless your favor, unless your friendship goes with me. A longing for God. David says in Psalm 42, as the deer panteth for the streams of living water, so my soul, soul meaning the essence of who I am. Right, you're, you could be hungry in your stomach, but when you're hungry in your soul, you're looking for something more. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. My God, my soul thirsts for God, the living God. When can I go to meet him? Do you see that? you see the eagerness? It's like, uh, it's like, when can I go? When can I go? When I first started dating my wife, when my phone would ring, I would run to get the phone. Y'all remember those days, husbands? Like, you know, hello? <laughs> hey, baby, what you doing? Mm -hmm, just thinking about you. You just, you have this excitement. David is so excited and so eager to be in the presence of God. He says, when can I go? That's like a kid in Disneyland or wanting to go to Disneyland. And his dad says, we're going to Disneyland tomorrow. And the dad wakes up. The kids are ready to wake up at 4 in the morning like, dad, when can we go? When can we go? When can we go? I'm looking for people that feel that way before they go to a prayer meeting. I'm looking for people that are feeling that way before they go to a service. They wake up and like, when does worship start? When does prayer start? When does the preaching of God's word start? David is longing for God. And when he says, as a deer pants for water, 
He's talking about a deer who's not going to stop until it finds it. A deer is so thirsty, it's longing for this. Right? Let's go further. David says in Psalm 63, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In this dry and weary land where there is no water, so have I looked upon your sanctuary in the desert, in the wilderness, in the midst of dryness. Man, thirsty people are thankful for one drop of water. You know that? Hungry people are good for one verse. Arrogant people are like, give me more. You know, maybe it's not your preacher's fault. Maybe it's your fault. Maybe you're not hungry enough. Maybe it's not the worship leader's fault. Maybe it's we're not thirsty enough. I always tell people, what makes a good preacher? A hungry audience. What makes a great leader? A submitted follower. Why? Because David is as in this dry and weary land where there is no water. I have looked upon your sanctuary. I have beheld your power and your glory. And I will praise you as long as I live because your love is better than life. Longing. Are you guys catching this? This is not just a dry relationship. Like a lot of Asian parents. I know not all y'all Asian but our parents stopped loving each other 40 years ago. <laughs> I mean, they do, but it's like, did you eat? Yeah, all right, good night. That's it. <laughs> there's no, like, honey. There's no baby, right? That's, a lot of our relationships with God is like that. Isaiah says in Isaiah 26, 9, my soul yearns for you in the night. My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seek you. What are you doing at night? Come on now. <laughs> Probably stalking your friends on Instagram, watching pornography, playing League of Losers, League of Legends, and video games, <laughs> watching YouTube. What are you doing at night? Think about it. What are you doing? Thinking about food, <laughs> thinking about your final exams. Isaiah's laying at night. He says, I just, I, I just want God. <laughs> So I can't wait till I wake up so I can pray. Have you ever felt that way? There are seasons in my life I go to sleep because I can't wake up to read the word. My brain's too fried to read it at night. So I'm like, Lord, tomorrow morning I'm going to meet you. Isaiah is saying, in the night when I'm laying in bed, he says, my soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly, not apathetically, not casually, earnestly seeks you. There's just one more. I mean, even two more. Even Mary sits at the feet of Jesus, a posture of receiving. A disciple, she sits. She's like, give me more. Martha's cleaning the dishes. Like, my little sister, I'm going to kill her, right? <laughs> Clean the chairs. Mary's like, give me more. More, more. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, I tell you the truth. You are concerned about many things, but only one thing is required. And Mary has chosen the good portion, and this will not be taken away from her. Paul says, but whatever gain I had, I count as loss. Who says that? That's like me saying, whatever mega church I have, I don't care. Whatever big business I have, I don't care. Whatever Ivy League school I got, I don't care. No matter what reputation, I, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything. Everyone say everything. I looked it up. In the Greek, everything means everything. <laughs> it means no comparison. It was to the point where he said, I'll be single for the rest of my life to do the work of God. I can't say that, Jesus. Please, thank you for my wife. Thank you, Jesus. He said, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing. That's the same word that's used for intimacy, physical intimacy between Adam and Eve in the Septuagint. When they translate it into Greek to know, is this intimacy of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. You know what rubbish means? It means trash. It means crap. Like compared to having Christ, everything is crap. Like when I look at my wife, I go like, how can I? She's amazing. I look at other girls, she's amazing. Compared to everyone else, com everyone compared to her is rubbish. He's saying, compared to Jesus, everything is like trash. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish 
in order that I may gain Christ. The Bible is filled with people who long for God. David wanted God so bad. He said, I'm sitting here in a palace. Second Samuel, I think, 7, right? I'm sitting here in a palace. I'm going to make God a temple so God's presence could be with us. The disciples were so crazy about Jesus, they decided, let's get 120 of us and lock ourselves in a room. And they were like, Peter, what's the plan? We got no plan. Peter, what time does service start now? What time does it end when he shows up? Peter, what time is lunch? We're fasting. <laughs> Peter, who's going to preach? The Holy Spirit. They wanted God so bad, 120 people locked themselves up and said, let's pray. Let's pray. He promised us. He's sending the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's why the New Testament church was so much more powerful than us. In fact, the church didn't begin with the sermon. It began in a prayer meeting. It didn't begin with an event or an evangelist. It began on people's knees crying out, I want the Holy Spirit. Crazy people that wanted the presence of God. So here's the question. How can we increase our yearning for God? How can we grow in our longing and hunger for God? Before we get there, let's first address what quenches our yearning? What stops our hunger? Because in every single one of us, actually, you don't know this, but there's a deposit. It's called the image of God. The imago Dei. Everyone here longs for God. Every single person in mankind, no matter what religion you believe in, as far as history goes, man has longed for God. But the problem is, it got quenched. It got spoiled. And what stops it from growing? Number one, familiarity. When you are too familiar with the things of God, you stop yearning for God. When you stop looking at God with the eyes of mystery, when you forget that his wisdom is ocean deep, when you forget that his love is sky high, when you forget that he is uncomprehendable, when you forget that he is the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, the lion and the lamb, when you forget he is God, Emmanuel, and you get too familiar with the things of God, it quenches your longing and yearning for God. Excuse me when I say this, but some of the hardest people to preach to are church folks. By the grace of God, I have preached everywhere. Like, I mean, okay, not everywhere, in many places. <laughs> By God's grace, I have preached in prisons. I have preached at half, uh, uh, halfway homes, women's shelters. I just preached last week at uh, uh, Orange County Jail. I preached in different countries. The hardest place for me to preach oftentimes is church folks. Just last week, I was preaching in, in, in a jail cell with just four guys. The moment I opened my mouth, this guy just started crying. I said, I want to talk to you guys tonight, I mean today, about how Jesus calms the storm. And this kid just, and I was like, oh, God is here. Thank you, Jesus. Because <laughs> before that, I was intimidated. Like, I mean, I'm in jail. I don't know what's going to happen, right? And he just puts his eyes out. And I'm like, I'm telling you right now, though you're in a storm, Jesus is with you. He just, <laughs> and I was just like, what the heck? I didn't say anything. I just said, storm, Jesus, breakthrough. You know what I mean? And at the end, I said, if you want to know Jesus, and in the middle of, if you, just raise his hand. This kid received Jesus. Do you have that picture over here of the Laos? Oh, I went to a country. <laughs> I preached a horrible sermon here, I promise you. As I was preaching, I was like, this sermon sucks. And that's me and the guitar, yes, Dale, stop making fun of me. He looked at my wife, is that him singing? Oh, my gosh, right? But I just said, if you want to know, and they just, they all just, just came like this. And they all just, yes. And they just all kneel down. Every single one. This is, it looks like all women, but on the right side, it's all men. And they just came so broken, so hungry. Why? Because they're not familiar. They haven't heard, they haven't heard Tim Keller. They haven't heard Francis Chan. They haven't heard John Piper. They haven't heard, all they heard, in fact, they haven't heard much. So with what they hear, next picture. This guy, we just walked into the sanctuary. He's like 20-something years old. 
the moment we walked in, this pastor just started crying. And I started crying, and the translator couldn't even translate. So we had a, we had a cry. We just had a moment. Like, we are just all crying. And I was like, I don't know why he's crying. I don't know why I'm crying. I was like, John, why are you crying? And he said, you guys are the first foreign missionaries to ever come to our church. And he's just weeping. He says, we have prayed for someone to come and teach us more about God. And you know what else happened? A week before that, the police came and destroyed the road to their church because it's illegal to evangelize there. But people like this, they're not familiar like we are. They don't have YouTube clicks like we have. They don't follow celebrity pastors. They actually follow Jesus. They don't follow crowds. They actually follow the Holy Spirit. And these people have a yearning for God. They have a longing for God. Hosea 11 says, when you were hungry, I fed you. And when I fed you, you became full. But once you became full, you became proud, then you forgot me. You see, we are too familiar with the things of God. I want to read something to you guys in Mark chapter 6. Fascinating passage. The only place geographically where the Bible says Jesus could do no miracles except a few mighty deeds. It says right here, he went away, Mark 6, 1 through 5, I read it to you, from there and came to his hometown. And his disciples followed him and on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. Where is the synagogue? It's church for them where they opened the scriptures. He began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished. Saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? This is where it becomes familiarity. This is where it goes from faith to religion. It just, it just goes from, oh, oh, whatever, it's just church. It says here, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is without honor, except in his hometown, among his relatives, and his own household. And this is the crazy part. This is the man who walked on water. He multiplied the five loaves and two bread. He opened the eyes of the blind. He raised Lazarus from the dead. But it says in verse 5, and Jesus can do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their lack of faith, because of their unbelief, because they're too familiar, because it became too programmatic, it became too institutional, it became just a thing you do on Sunday, a thing you do on Wednesday nights, but there wasn't no longing. In comparison to Mark chapter 5, the woman who was bleeding for 12 years says, if I could just touch his cloak, if I could just touch the hem of his garments, if I could just, if I could just, just and Jesus says, who touched me? The disciple says, everybody touching you. <laughs> Too familiar. I, I touched you. <laughs> He's like, no, somebody touched me with hunger. Somebody touched me with faith. Y'all touched me in the flesh. He touched my spirit. Y'all touched me just out of religion. She touched me because she had a yearning and a longing for me. When you are too familiar with the things of God, you are in danger. You are in danger of becoming a Pharisee. I'm telling you right now, I think one of the biggest mission fields are, is the church. I'm, I'm going off a uh, manuscript, but one time I was driving to a church, to a youth group. And as I was going there, I was praying. And I was like, Lord, I want to go back to the public schools. I want to preach to high schools again. I want to go to the rehabs and prisons. Why are you sending me to this youth group? And a conviction, not an audible voice, the conviction came. These youth groups is the new mission field because <laughs> they grew up in church, but they didn't grow up in God. <laughs> they grew up in religion, but they didn't grow up in relationship. They grew up in rules, but they didn't grow up in grace. And I went there, and I did an altar call for how many of you guys want to get saved, and they all came up. I said, what the heck? <laughs> you're supposed to be saved. I was like, go back if you're not sure. And they all stayed up. I'm not saved. I was like, what? <laughs> Danger. Lord, Lord, do we not cast out demons in your name? Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? Lord, Lord, do we not heal the sick in your name? Depart from me, I never knew you. Too familiar. Grew up in church and treat church like a playground, playground and not like the reverence, reverent presence of God. Are you too familiar? Number two, what quenches, what stops? Worldly pleasures and worldly ambitions. 
I'm not talking about sin here. I'm not talking about lust. I'm not talking about murder. I'm not talking about pornography and adultery. I'm talking about worldly pleasures that originally are a good gift from God. But we make it an idol and we worship the creature instead of the creator. Worldly desires and worldly pleasures and ambitions is the excessive indulgence of good things. Video games, come on now. Social media, come on now. YouTube, come on. Some of y'all are going to get to heaven and be so mad that you spent a year on Facebook. <laughs> Forget that. Five years. <laughs> Just, what's everyone doing? My life sucks. <laughs> Maybe six years on YouTube. This generation coming up, Jesus. Worldly pleasures quenches intimacy with God, God, and that's why the Bible says do not grieve the Holy Spirit, do not quench the Holy Spirit. In fact, my wife and I, majority of our fights are small things, not big things. It's the small things that quenches intimacy between us. It's you didn't do the dishes, sorry. <laughs> the next day you didn't do it again, I'm so sorry, all right? Can you clean the clothes, why? It's the small things in the same way you think you're just watching TV. Not knowing that you're indulging in the flesh. This is what it says in Luke chapter 8 verse 14 when it talks about the parable of the soil. The Bible says the kingdom of God is like a man who went out to sow seed. And there's four different types of soil. One seed fell along the path. One seed fell in rocky soil. One seed fell in thorny soil. And one seed fell in good soil. And the good soil is the only soil when that soil was able to receive the things of God. The thorny one, it says in verse 14, this is what it means. As for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go their way, they are choked by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of life. And their fruit does not mature. Cares means worries of life. Money, what am I going to drink? What am I going to eat? How am I going to pay for rent? The cares, riches, worldly ambitions. Do you know what God had to kill in me? Not, it's not past tense, it's present tense. Kill in me the desire for a big ministry. It seems like a good thing, but it became a God thing because I took what was good and made it mine. The biggest struggle of my life is I want to make it as a minister. That's what we're talking about, worldly pleasures. When it says riches, it's talking about making a career, making a good name, making a big following, making, being su successful. Those things quench the purity of longing for the things of God. You know why David was so amazing? When he committed adultery with Bathsheba, if I was David, I would have prayed, don't take away the kingdom. Don't take away the money. Don't take away the ministry. You know what David prays? Don't take away your spirit. I don't care about my name. I don't care about my ministry. The riches of this world, Lord, I know I sin, but please, please cast me not away from your spirit. And when we have riches and the pleasures of life is leisure and comfort. And some of y'all are choosing leisure and comfort outside other than the will of God. The will of God is not comfortable, but it is amazing. The will of God will take you to the weirdest places in the world. It will take you there in those pictures where you're like, what am I doing here? It will take you inside a jail cell, like, why am I here? I might die. It will take you to another state. It will take you anywhere. The will of God is where you want to be. But Jesus says the desires for riches, the desires for pleasure, the desires for cares and worries chokes the work of God. Some of you high schoolers, I know, I, I, I hear we have junior hires all the way to adults. Trust me. Being famous is not that great. <laughs> Don't get likes. It just gets you more anxious. <laughs> Don't get followers. College students, Cal State's not that bad. I'm playing, I'm playing, right? But don't be so ambitious. <laughs> Working professionals, don't get so caught up in your future career. You're just but a mist that flies away. Live for God. Follow God. Pastors, who cares about a big ministry? <laughs> 
It really doesn't matter. All that matters is that you're doing the will of God. If God wants you to be a small church, then be the best small church. If God wants you to have a big church, have the biggest big church. The only thing that matters is being faithful. These things quench these longings and hungers for God. Number three, what quenches your yearning? I'll just say it flat out, sin. When I say sin here, I'm not talking about a one-time sin. Because I believe sometimes, I don't know how I can explain this theologically. <laughs> I think sometimes God allows us to fall into sin to remind us that we're a piece of crap. <laughs> Excuse my language. <laughs> I believe sometimes we fall into old sins so we could be reminded that apart from the grace of God, we are nothing. That's what the Bible says in Romans 5, I think 20, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So even in our grace, I heard a pastor say, when you fall into sin, don't worry, because the lowest you can go is Jesus. I was like, whoo, that's good. No matter how low you fall, you can't go lower than Jesus holding you up with the cross, right? But I'm not talking about that sin. I'm talking about continual, unrepentant sin. That is so dangerous. It's one thing to struggle with lust. It's another thing to indulge in lust. It's one thing to fall in greed. It's another thing to indulge in greed. When you start living a sinful lifestyle, you just, you're numb. Some of y'all think the person next to you is emotional. No, they're not. They just love God. One time somebody came up to me and said, yo, Pastor Will, why do you worship like that? I was like, you don't know where I come from. <laughs> So you don't know my story. You don't know what I've been through. I can't help it. That's like the woman with the alabaster jar that broke the jar. And the Pharisee's like, why is she doing that? She could have saved that money. He's like, you don't know what she's been through. You don't know what she's gone through. It's because they're so stuck in their own sin that they're so numb to the presence of Jesus. A lot of you guys, you're stuck in so much sin that even if God's in the room, you don't even know. And you're just, you look at the person next to you like, yo, why are you crying? Why are you praising like that? I'll tell you why, because they're walking with God. I'll tell you why, because they're longing for God. The first thing that quenches it, right, is familiarity. Number two is worldly pleasures and ambitions. Number three is sin that leads to the hardness of your heart. Such a dangerous place to be. That's why the Bible says repent. Just do it right there. Like, don't accumulate repentance. <laughs> Some people do that. I grew up in church. They're like, I'm going to watch as much pornography for two weeks. So in two weeks at the retreat, Jesus forgive me, right? It's like, like I'm going to play video games all night. I'm going to smoke weed and do yay all weekend. Don't accumulate it. Repent right there. Right there in that moment. Now here we go. This is my part where I wanted to really preach. How do you increase your yearning? How do you increase your hunger? How do you get it? Number one, get around some hungry people. If you want your hunger to increase, if you want your longing and yearning for God to increase, get around some people who are hungry for the things of God. When you don't have it, find someone else that has it, and what they have might rub off of you. I believe hunger cannot be taught. It has to be caught. I believe the things of God are caught, not taught. My mentor did not teach me the Bible. He said, follow me. <laughs> Let's go to Mexico. I said, where are we going? He said, preach. I said, when? Right now. Ayúdame, señor. <laughs> Necesito tu presencia, Señor. Por favor. Hay poder en nombre de... You just start going. You just start doing it. And when I followed my fault, why do you think Elisha followed Elijah? He said, Elijah, give me your mantle. No, I can't. Why? Follow me. This is not... It doesn't come easy, son. You got to catch it. When, you, when, when I go up and you're there, woo, I'll give it to you, right? If you want a hunger... Get around some people who are hungry. The Bible says in Mark chapter 2, the paralytic was healed because their faith. I thought it was the paralytic's faith. No, I read it again. It says he was healed because their faith. When you don't have faith, get around someone who has faith. When you don't have a longing for God, get around people who have a longing for God. Let me tell you something. If you, in your room, you love God the most, your room doesn't love God enough. Let me just say something. Some people are too insecure to get around people better than them. 
They would rather isolate themselves and not fail than expose themselves to people who are further than them because the only way you're actually going to grow is when you're next to someone that's ahead of you. Some people are too insecure to do the will of God. Some people, it's not even insecure, they are too prideful to do the will of God. But when you get around somebody that's hungry, it's like, I love God. What happened? These past few weeks, I've had the grace and the honor and the privilege to meet some of my heroes. I don't know how it happened, but we're just in the room. I'm like, I- I'm talking to this guy right now. I'm talking to this guy right now. I'm talking to this right I finally know what junior high girls feel like when they see Justin Bieber. I never understood why junior high girls freak out when they see celebrities until I saw T.D. Jakes, Francis Shannon, David Platt. It was like, I became like a, hi, I became like a little kid. I was having lunch with one of them, right? I couldn't even speak because I was just like. <laughs> he was like, what do you do? I was like, um, 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 um what? <laughs> so I felt like, a little, oh, this is what junior high girls feel when they see their celebrity crush. Forgive me, Jesus, right? But you know what was crazy? I was in the room with David Platt, and we were just talking. I was like, all we're doing is talking. And as we're talking, he just starts quoting Bible verses. Just, 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 it's like his vocabulary. In fact, he quoted Psalm 63. He's like, yeah, in this dry and weary land where there is no water, we have looked upon your sanctuary. My soul thirsts for you. I eagerly desire. I'm just like, I'm going to memorize Bible verses. <laughs> I remember I left that meeting. I looked at my wife. We're going to do, my, we're going to do Bible memory verses now. <laughs> the following week, I had a meeting with, uh, I had somehow, some way, I met Bishop T.D. Jakes, and we get into the room, and we're having lunch. And I asked the question. I said, Bishop, got to call him by his, you know, the proper name, my first lady. I said, Bishop, I got a question for you. He said, he looks at me. I was like, you look, I think I was looking at Dale. So I was like, he's like, yeah, you Korean boy. I was like, oh, oh. He said, I know you now. I looked at Dale, and Dale had his hand up. He was like, man, frick. I was the only Asian there, me and my boy Juan, right? And I said, Pastor, I said, Bishop, if there's one thing that this generation needs to have as you die, what will it be? And he just starts talking. He finally stops and he says, the word of God. (laughs) I was like, what? (laughs) Come on, give me something more. He's like, (laughs) and he started crying. He's like, y'all don't know how much I love God's word. He's like, when I didn't have the fame, when I didn't have the stage, when I didn't have, I had the word of God. That's what he says, right? I was like, oh. He's like, you could take it all from me, but you can't take his word. Oh, I love his word. I was so shocked. I was like, that's it. I left that room. I'm going to memorize every single Bible verse I can learn. Me and my boy, Chi Won and Del, we were talking about, we didn't talk about his ministry. We talked about his hunger for God. We didn't talk about things they did. We talked about who they are. You see, get around some hungry people. Some of you, you're, I don't, when you're around different, they say words like destiny. Your destiny is next to meeting someone that propels you into your future. You're staying in your comfort. They, they, they met in Jerusalem, but they ended in Rome. They had to go. Get around some people that challenge you. Get around some people that love God. I want to share one thing, one last thing about this that stirred me and gave me a hunger that never left me. There's a book by Hudson Taylor's children, and it's called The Secret Power of Us, The Secrets of Spiritual Power, Hudson Taylor. And his son writes about his father being so busy in China in the mid 1800s. In the mid-1800s, Hudson Taylor was one of the first missionaries to go to China and adopt Chinese culture. He cut his hair like a Chinese person. He grew out his facial hair like a Chinese person. He started eating Chinese food. He started wearing Chinese clothes. By the time he died, he mobilized 800 people to China full time. This is before airplanes. I'm talking about when they used to pack their bags in coffins. It's not a two-way trip. They're not flying Delta, okay? They're flying Pacific Ocean, dead or alive, right? They're going. 800 people, he mobilized them. And this is what I read. If you can't find hungry people, find their books. I'm telling you, it works. And this is what it says. I have a quote for you in the back. This is what his son says. To him, the secret of overcoming lay in daily, hourly fellowship with God. 
And this he found could only be maintained by secret prayer and feeding upon the word through which he reveals himself to the waiting soul. It was not easy for Mr. Taylor, shows respect to his dad, right, in his changeful life to make time for prayer and Bible study. But he knew that it was vital. Well do the writers remember traveling with him month after month in northern China by the cartwheel and wheelbarrow in the poorest of inns at night, often with only one room for the coolies and the travelers alike. Coolies were the people that used to work. They would screen off the corner of the father and, for an, and another for themselves with curtains of some sort. This is the part that killed me. It says, and then, after sleep at last had brought a measure of quiet, they would hear a match struck and see the flicker of the candlelight, which told Mr. Taylor, however weary, was poring over the little Bible in two volumes always at hand. From 2 to 4 a.m. was the time he usually gave to prayer. The time when he could be most sure of being undisturbed with God. You know what I did after I read this? I set my alarm to 4 a.m. and woke up at 8 a.m. I said, honey, when you wake up, I'm going to be gone. I woke up. She woke up. I'm like. (laughs) And a guy named uh, Dr. John Piper. John Piper talks about this in an article. He calls the article The Strike. The match. And no matter where they were, no matter what country they were at, at four, two and four in the morning, you'll hear a shh, and you'll see Hudson Taylor reading the word. I read that and hunger just, I was like, I just want God's word. Get around some hungry people that challenge you, amen? This is his last point, actually. Number two, feast at his table. In the natural world, you get hungry by not eating. In the spiritual world, you get hungry by eating more. In the natural world, when you don't eat, you get hungry. You want this, you want that, you're thirsty. But in the spiritual world, the more you eat, the hungrier you get. And that is why Jesus, when he was fasting 40 days, he meditated on the word of God. And he says the first thing, for man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. He was eating a food they knew not about. It even says here, right, in Psalm, I believe, I had 19, oh, 119, 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. You want to get more hunger for God? Start reading his word. As you read his word, an appetite that you never knew was down there will begin to bubble up in your stomach. Some people think, if I don't read his word for a long time, I'll get hungrier. No, you'll get fuller. Fuller with the world. Fuller with sin. Fuller with the flesh. But when you read his word, it's like, "Mm, mm, I never knew it tasted so good. Mm." I feel like crazy, I'm sorry. Someone just looked at me like... (laughs) You gotta feast. You gotta eat. Y'all might be physically buff, but you're spiritually malnourished, man. It's embarrassing. You grew up in church your whole life, but you're spiritually malnourished. You should read, you should eat some food. Last point in this when I say feast at his table, here we go fast and pray. Fasting is not just abstaining from food. Fasting is abstaining from anything that hinders your relationship with God. Fasting is not starving yourself. Fasting is actually feeding yourself on the things of God. A lot of people think fasting is abstaining from food. No, it's not. It's abstaining from anything that hinders your walk with God. But food happens to be many times the gateway to the flesh. I, I know a pastor, right? <laughs> Have you ever thought you love God until you met someone that loved God? <laughs> it's like growing up in Korea, I grew up in the military base in the U.S. Army, but I also grew up outside the base. And when I played basketball with Korean people, I was the bomb. I was Michael Jordan. 
I walked 15 minutes into Yongsan U.S. Army military base. I was the worst. I was uh, last pick. Right? I thought I was a baller until I met some brothers who bowled me up. You think you love God until you meet someone that actually loves God. And when you fast, you're feeding that love for God. We don't fast because we don't want food. We fast because we want God more. We don't fast because we don't want social media. We fast because we want God more. We don't fast from entertainment because we don't like TV, but we fast because we want God more. And this pastor I met loved God more than I did. I'm not questioning his love for me. I'm questioning my love for him. When I say, God, I love you, and Apostle Paul says, I love you, we mean two completely different things. I mean like, Lord, I'll preach at TMP. <laughs> Paul means put me on a ship to Rome and shipwreck me, stone me, clothe naked, hungry, poor. I don't care. I've learned what it means to be content in every situation. He said, whether clothed or naked, hungry or poor, I mean rich or poor, hungry or well-fed, I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's I love you is not the same as mine. It's on his confession. This pastor looked at me and said, Will, I fast two days a week. Every week for the past 13 years. I said, you're a liar. He said, no, I'm serious. Like his church is a, it's, it's, a, it's an army. This church, I have so much respect for him. In fact, we lead a monthly pastor's training with 26 pastors. First person I invited was him. And not only that, he says, I don't just do a fast. I do what is called a dry fast. I don't drink or eat. I said, you're going to die. <laughs> so we jokingly call that, hit by it. We, call, well, we, have, we fast once a month together, and we call it the pastor min fast. I mean, you're going to do the pastor min fast? <laughs> You're going to the no, right? And he was like, well, I said, well, why did he, he ask me? Well, I want to challenge you fast once a week. I said, the devil is a liar. No, I'm not. I was like, I'm fasting from fasting. I'm good. And he said, the Bible says in all three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself. When does anyone in America ever deny themselves? I was like, don't you hate it when, like, God starts speaking? You're like, nah, nah. <laughs> Manipulation tactics. Nah, nah, nah. He said, Will, just trust me. Just fast once a week. I came home. I said, honey, I'm going to fast. She said, good. I said, what? She said, when I fast, I become nicer. I become more humble. I'm so hungry. I don't care about anything else. I'm not as controlling. So the funny thing is, right when we fight now, she goes like, did you fast this week? I'm not saying the Bible commands us to fast. But if you want to grow in your hunger, I'm not trying to build an audience. I'm trying to build an army. If you want to grow in your faith, fast. Let me tell you what fasting is. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 18, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces and their fasting may be seen by others. They want to be seen by people. Truly, truly, I say to you, they have Receive their reward. But when you fast, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. That means have joy, you know that? Be happy. That your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is what Jesus is saying. When you fast, God sees you. A lot of people do things to show off. They put it, uh, I don't want to just, I'm not saying this is always wrong, but the, people are reading the Bible, and it's supposed to be between them and God, and they put it on Instagram. It's like, why are you sharing your, anyways, right? But it's like, they're always, but Jesus says, no, 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 no. Go, go away, go away, go away. Why? Because fasting is not about being seen by man, but it's about being seen by God. Fasting does something where God sees you. Even though God sees everyone, his favor follows the one who seeks him. The Bible says God looks to and fro. God looks east, east, yeah, east to west. He looks east to west to find a man whose heart is fully committed to him that God may strengthen. And what that means is that he actually looks. Do you, do you, you love me, David? Here, here's the kingdom. You love me, Solomon? Here's wisdom. 
You love me, Moses? Here's leadership. You love me, Peter? Here's preaching. You love me, Mary? Here's prayer. You, all these things, you see all these things, right? you see all throughout the Bible, you love me, Deborah? Here's the kingdom. It's crazy. And what fasting does is it weakens your flesh so you could be seen by God and it's your confession. I want more of God. Just yes, two days ago, it's around 8 o'clock and I was sitting at the kitchen table and I was on the computer and I felt like, okay, I'm going to go on Facebook and YouTube. And then all of a sudden I just, conviction, go and pray. I was all right, God, I went into my room, I grabbed the guitar, and you know what's the most hurtful thing? When I come outside after I sing worship, my, my wife has headphones on. <laughs> <laughs> and all, all the doors are closed. <laughs> She's like, why? It was so loud, you know, but I'm just, this is what happens. I'm, see, I'm praying for TMP, like, God, move, and I'm singing songs. And all of a sudden, in the middle of my prayer, my prayer changes, and I know it's the Holy Spirit, because the Bible says the Holy Spirit will pray things that we cannot pray, will groan things. It, out of my mouth came, I don't care about TMP. I want more of you. I was like, God, use me. All of a sudden, out of my mouth, I was like, I don't care if you don't use me. I just want more of you. And I was like, I want, I want a scripture that's about longing for God. And I was like, where is it? I went to, I went to uh, Philippians 3.8. Indeed, I count it all as loss. Compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, indeed, I count everything as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I was like, God, I just want you. I just want you. I just want you. And then I went to Psalm 63. My God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in this dry and weary land where there is no water. I beheld your temple. I want you. And I felt it for the first time like, oh, this is what it does to you. You just want God. That's when you know you're longing for God. You know how you know you, you went from JV to varsity? JV Christians say, God, give me joy. Varsity Christians say, you are my joy. JV Christians say, give me peace. Varsity says, you are my peace. It's God, give me this. No, give me you. That's so why Jesus said, I am the living bread. In other words, I didn't come to give you bread. I came to be your bread. And that's when you start longing for God. And we're going to close with this. Some of you don't have this longing. I'm talking to you and it's like a foreign language. You're like, why are you speaking Spanish to me? Why are you speaking man? I don't know what you're talking about. I'll, I'll, I want to suggest to you, it's because you might not be saved. The Bible says in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will remove the heart of stone. And give you the heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you. I will cause you to obey my commandments. Maybe your heart is still stone. And let me tell you why. It's because sin spoiled your appetite. Because what you really want is that main course, not that bread in front of you. Do you guys remember as kids, we used to go to restaurants every now and then when your parents saved money? And they'll go and they'll be like, don't eat the bread. It's a trap. <laughs> And I would eat all the bread. <laughs> and when the steak came out, I couldn't eat it. Because I chose that which wasn't meant for me. When you eat from sin, when you indulge in sin, you're actually eating trash. You're eating fake stuff. What you really want is God. In John chapter 19, verse 28, it says that Jesus on the cross, he stretches out his arm, and this is what he says. He says, I thirst. The reason why he says, I thirst, is because at that moment, his relationship with God was ceased. It was cut off so that we never need to be cut off from Jesus. He, he took our sin at that moment. He took it. He, he, was, he longed for God, but he said, I thirst. That thing quenched. It stopped. He became sin so that he who knew no sin he who, he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. All you need to do tonight is say, Lord, forgive me. I have lived for myself. I want to follow you. And you watch what happens to your life. 
I got saved on February 18, 2006, and everything changed. I used to hate God. I used to hate church. But when the Holy Spirit came, there is this well inside of me. Let's close our eyes.